The reading this morning is Spiritual Warfare, The Shield and Helmet, Ephesians 6, 14 through 18. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the true spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's word. Thank you. <clears throat> We have been in a series uh, in Ephesians, and we are in the sixth chapter, and we've been talking about this very famous section, the armor of God. And what's, we've talked about this, that Paul introduces it to us by saying, finally. And, and you know, preachers do that, don't we? We say, um, finally, but we don't mean it. You know, and then we just droll on. You know, but um, he meant it. But, but he meant finally, meaning... I'm going to be sharing with you something so important. I've left it to the end. You know, you've written a letter and you've kind of the nicety, the nicety, the nicety. And you go, hey, but here's the shot, man. You know, at the end of the letter. Do you remember letters with stamps? <laughs> Anybody write letters? I know that you write letters and cards and, and they're amazing. And that's part of your ministry. And it's so beautiful. But I remember letters and stamps. <clears throat> How much does a stamp cost nowadays? $85. $85. Okay. All right. Well, he saves this part to the end of the sermon because it's so important. And he's using this metaphor of a, a soldier. And he's comparing parts of the armor of the, that the soldier is wearing to certain things that Christians need to incorporate into their life. Right? And he begins, we've been talking about this quite a bit, um, about truth. How important is truth huh? for us as Christians to know what's true? Because there's so much out there that's not true. And when you know the truth, Jesus said the truth, what? Set you free. It sets you free from all the false stuff that's out there. And we have really talked a lot about the need for truth. Christians need to stand for the truth. Paul says, stand therefore. Stand for the truth. You know what? Uh, Ken and I were talking this morning. I, I believe this is true. If I had a thousand people in an auditorium and, and, um, and um, they claim to be evangelical Christians, right? And I said to, to this crowd, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a test. But I, I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I would say, how many of you in this crowd who are evangelicals <laughs> believe that if you're, um, a, say, a Mormon... You, you believe in the Mormon Jesus. That you believe that Mormons are as Christian as a, an evangelical who claims that, that um, Jesus is the only way. How many in this crowd believes that Mormons are Christians? A lot would raise their hand. Or Jehovah's Witness. Because they have Jesus, right, in there. Right? Or uh, we would have other, other test questions. Like, mm, how important is it to believe in the virgin birth? Right? Because, hey, look, when you read the Bible, Mary says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. No, if, if, if Mary has known a man, Mary's lying. Right? She's faithless. She has, she, man, she has stepped out on Joseph. And so if the, if the, we're going to believe the Bible because the Bible states that. And if I had, well, how many of you believe in the virgin birth? There would be a lot of people that would not raise their hands. Well, look, we need to know the truth. We need to know the truth because we need to know what's not true. And a lot, everything I just told you, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, if you don't believe the virgin birth, you have a different Jesus. You don't have the biblical Jesus. And Paul talked about that in the book of Galatians. Is the virgin birth essential to our faith? It is so essential to our faith. Leave it out and you have a different Jesus. 
Not the same one. And who knows who daddy was? We don't know. So th we need to know the truth. And then he talks about this, this other thing. We talked about the, the shoes, the importance of the shoes. Paul looks down, he sees the Romans' um, shoes, these, the, these incredible uh, technologically advanced shoes. We talked about that last week. And hey, these shoes were amazing, gave them a leg up. Yeah. And uh, also, they uh, prevented the soldier from stepping on these spike things that people would put in the ground and try to um, impale the foot of the soldiers. The gospel protects us. Protects us. In fact, I kind of lightly said this last week, that what the gospel does, it, it prevents things from penetrating your soul. It does. So we talked about that last week. So now, today we're in Ephesians 6, uh, 16. And I want you to listen to how, listen to how he says this. It's, it's so important. In all circumstances. Now, when you try to answer this question, what does all circumstances mean? I think it does. I think you can just write on the test, it means all circumstances. And that's what Paul means here. In all circumstances, look at this. You're, everything you're doing in your life, you're, even when you're buying a car, or you're, you're renting something, or you're going out to the grocery store, you're at the grocery store, um, you're walking around because you can't afford to buy anything anymore. Um, in all circumstances, you remember when Turkey is where you can buy a turkey? And it didn't cost you so much? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can, you can extinguish all, all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, now, why is that? Because like it or not, a Christian has a target on their back. You have a target. And God has provided for us protection against these, he, Paul's, these flaming arrows uh, that come against us. Satan, listen, Satan is real. And so you can extend these flaming darts of the evil one, you need this shield of faith. Do you know what his greatest weapon is against us? What is his greatest weapon? It is discouragement. His goal is to discourage the Christian. When we get discouraged, this is what we do. We tend to leave our faith somewhere else. We leave it beside the road and we just go it alone when we're discouraged. You know, maybe you're discouraged. Maybe someone in your life is discouraged. They're without God. They're without God, without faith right now. But that's what we do. When we get discouraged, we get down in the dumps. I went to the dump the other day, and during the summer, the dump is horrendous. Do you know how bad it smells? The one down the road here, you know the one I'm talking about near your house? It's not real near your house. Now you know, Charlie. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You can't, I mean, it's just, it just, it, it'll gagify you. It's that bad. You know, that's what, Satan wants us to get down in the dumps. Because here, when you're down in the dump, life stinks. It does. It just stinks when you're discouraged. You, you got kids that are discouraged. They're down in the dumps. And for them, they're negative. So negative. 
That's what discouragement does. Joshua 1.9. We're told about Joshua. And, you know, Joshua replaces Moses. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Replacing Moses? I mean, can you imagine someone replacing Charles Stanley in, in, at First Baptist Church? Charles Stanley, the Moses of Atlanta? I mean, how hard would that be? How hard would it be for Joshua to replace Moses? And everybody's looking to him. He's going through a discouraging time and God sees it. And this is what God says to, to Joshua. He says to him, Joshua, be strong. You're now assuming this leadership. Be strong and courageous. If he was strong and courageous, he wouldn't have had to say that. He was going through something. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged or dismayed. Same thing. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In other words, don't leave home without him. Yeah. Wherever you go. When we take up that shield of faith, man, we're taking God wherever we go. You know, and remember Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the Lord will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive. A virgin, by the way, Old Testament text. A virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel means what? What did God tell Joshua? Emmanuel's going with you. Wherever you go. In all circumstances, all circumstances, God is with you. I've read several books about Martin Luther, and he's just an amazing man of history, right? God used him to start the Reformation. Just amazing stuff. And I've been watching this documentary on Martin Luther that um, it's on YouTube. It's very good. And it, Luther was this man that God used so wonderfully, tremendously, right? But we would not know about Luther. We wouldn't even know he existed 500 years later. You know what? The only reason we know about Luther is because of what happened to him. Faith. The shield of faith. You wouldn't know his name. And he was a lost soul. He was, he was part of the Catholic Church. He was a monk. He was trained as a lawyer. And his, one day he had this experience out in the field. Lightning strikes. You ever make promises to God when something terrible happens? Lightning strikes. He says, oh God, if you'll save my life, I'll, I'll, I'll become a monk. He was a lawyer. And he did not monkey around. He did that. <laughs> he became a monk. He became, in fact, it was the most strict order among monastic orders, Augustinians. And man, he's, he's not a Christian. He's trying to earn his salvation. And then he discovers faith. The just shall live by faith. And this guy, who, who now he has faith in his life, living by faith, this faith becomes the means you, you want to accomplish a lot for God? Do it by faith. Do it with your faith. What, what are we saying? Trusting in God. Isn't that what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. In other words, God says, get out of the way. Trust me. Trust me. And this guy becomes, you want God to do something amazing in your life? Do it by faith. Trust in God. That's what he did. And the Reformation begins. Everything that Luther will do will be supported by his faith. The faith that God Almighty God had given him at his conversion. We will face difficulties. We're facing a difficulty right now. 
<clears throat> yeah, and you're facing, you will face difficulties, but it's by faith that we go through it. Amen? Jeremiah 29, 11. I know you love this verse. Jeremiah says, for I know the plans I have for you. Everybody loves this verse. I know the plans I have for you. Wow, good. Declares the Lord plans for your welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Man. Yeah, we love that verse. But those words must become a reality, a reality in our life. And they become a reality in our life by the exercising of our faith, believing those words are true. We place our faith in what that verse tells us. We have got to believe them. Or they're just words. They're just words on a piece of paper. And not a reality in our life. Because they're not embraced. They're the word of God. But until they're embraced by our faith. They're just words. And when they're just words and we read them. Or we, they're just words and we come to church. Or we're in a Bible study. Or we're, we're Christian people all around us. When they're just words. This is what happens. You become discouraged. When they're just words. And especially if, if something happens in your life. Someone breaks up with you. I have a friend of mine. He is so discouraged because his girlfriend broke up with him. And I said this to him. God has someone better. But he's so discouraged because they broke up. And we get discouraged. You know, when life is not... Easy. We can easily become discouraged. That's what Satan wants. The culture, man, the culture confuses us so much. And the culture can be a means of discouraging us unless we're resting on the faith that God gives to us. When the words of Scripture take a hold of our life, a reformation happens to us. Satan will do his dead level best. That's what he does. He does his dead level best from preventing us from living by faith, trusting in God. And he will, he will work so hard so that he will discourage us and then we walk out into the world uh, without God. In our life. We leave the shield at home. And when we do this. Listen. We become vulnerable. If you're not walking by faith. You are vulnerable to his flaming darts. And better believe he's going to throw them at you. And we're exposed. No protection. And we're unsafe. But when we take up that shield of faith. And life throws hardships at us, and it will. It's our faith that will keep discouragement from slamming into our life. We will stave off the demonic all around us. Job's wife, her, we don't know what her name is. She was the most discouraging woman in the Bible. She says to Job, curse God and die. That's encouragement. <laughs> Just curse God and get it over with, son. No, no, no. Man, you got to stave off. It might even come from your wife or your husband or your neighbor. Just slamming into your life. And what happens is this, and this is crazy, this is what happens. When we're discouraged, remember the breastplate of righteousness? Righteous, God wants us to be righteous. 
What happens is this, is that when you, leave the, when you leave the shield behind, when you're not walking by faith, you know what happens? You start becoming discouraged. And when you become discouraged, you know what happens? You become unrighteous. You do. Righteousness goes along with faith. That's why it's part of the armor. It's what comes next. Yeah. Faith is so important. Okay. Have we beaten that horse? I think so. I don't know why I say some of the things I say. My wife doesn't either. She's going, help him, Jesus. <laughs> Okay, one of the funniest things I have watched on television, I'm introducing a new subject here. This, is, uh, this was some years ago. It was uh, during a college football game. You've been watching a lot of college football? Yeah? Go Georgia? Yeah, okay. We live in Georgia. What else can we say? Come on. All right, so some years ago, I'm watching this, uh, this football game. And, uh, or this, this thing that happened on television. It was kind of bloopers. And, and uh, one of the college football players, um, after a touchdown, right? After a touchdown, the offensive player comes to the sideline and he starts celebrating. Man, he is so excited. He is celebrating. And this is what he does. You've seen it. He's headbutting everybody in his path. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, boom. Well, that's not the funny part. The funny part is he comes up to this kid and as he continues knocking on noggins, he hits this kid, boom, who isn't wearing a helmet. You know, there are times, do you ever laugh, laugh when you know you shouldn't? Yeah, that's one of those times. It was great. I mean, he just <laughs> knocked this kid, he just knocked this kid down. He hit him so hard. Boom. Pew. It was awesome. <laughs> so that, this introduces the next piece of equipment. The importance of a helmet. <laughs> yeah, the importance of a helmet, son. Don't, don't be, put the helmet on. Verse 17 says this. Take up the helmet of salvation. This is what we're going to talk about. Take up this helmet. You know, I was wondering if Paul, when he said this, was thinking about, listen to this, Psalm 40, verse 7. This is such a great text. O oh Lord, my Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Isn't that a beautiful? You have covered my head. You have. You are my salvation. So this piece of equipment is called the helmet of salvation. And, and we have salvation. You, you, if you are in Christ, you have salvation. We know that this is talking about people who have it because that's what he says in the text. The text says it is the helmet of of salvation. So if you have that helmet, if you're wearing that helmet, it's the helmet of salvation. You have salvation. Now the helmet protects the head. Don't th th that kid wishes he was wearing one, right? He, it protects your head. Why is that? Because the head is a major target for the enemy. It's a major target in your battles is your head. Satan will target the head, the mind. Thinking is targeted. You know this expression, you are what you eat. Listen, you are what you think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks, in his heart, so he is. You are what you think. Thinking is so important. He wants Christians to question 
their salvation. And listen, if you don't have it, you're probably questioning it. Because this is the helmet of it. And he wants us to question our salvation. But who does he want to question it? Christians. We're targeted with this. He wants us to doubt that we have attained our salvation. James talks about doubt. And he says this. The doubter, let not the doubter think that he will receive anything from the Lord. Someone who has all these doubts in their head. You know, you're not going to have answers to prayer. If you're someone, you're in what the Bible calls two minds. He says you're unstable. There's a lack of stability. Satan wants us to doubt our salvation. Why? Because his goal is to create in our minds what I'm calling salvation insecurity. Salvation insecurity. Insecurity is a national problem today. Uh, we're seeing it in all, all facets of life where kids are now insecure about their sexuality. So they're questioning, am I a male or a female? Look, you're a male or a female. Simple. But because we're so insecure, we're questioning our sexuality. Insecurity is such a national problem today. In fact, it is pandemic. And getting worse. Insecurity is an anxiety. It's an anxiety about yourself. And it creates in our minds a lack of confidence. The insecure don't share their faith because they lack confidence in themselves, maybe in the message. When we are insecure, we are afraid you become afraid and you, you feel threatened. Insecure people feel threatened. You're threatened even by your closest loved ones. You're threatened by your friends. You're threatened by coworkers. When you're insecure, you're fearful of fear. Someone was right. I don't know who said this, but I liked it when I read it. Stop allowing your own insecurity, look at this, stop it, to color the way you interpret someone else's intention. Isn't that good? Stop it. S spiritually, look at this. If I'm insecure about my salvation, right? If I'm insecure about my, my, my relationship with God, isn't this going to color the way I interpret God's intentions? Instead of trusting Him when things are really bad, and sometimes life is really bad, instead of trusting Him through this time, I begin to question God's intentions. Do you catch yourself saying when you're talking to someone um, who's concerned about you? Do, do, you, do you catch yourself saying this um, a lot? Yes, but when they're talking about God, your insecurity is coming out. Yes, but. When it comes to your salvation, there's no yes, but. It's yes. It's the helmet of salvation. No matter what's going on with you, good or bad, once saved, once you have become a follower of Jesus Christ, it is permanent. You have it or you don't have it. And if you do, you have it. Settle it. I've got it. Put on the helmet. Salvation insecurity, it develops in the mind. 
When we start questioning our salvation. And that's what he wants you to do. Insecurity is a killer. It kills your faith. Kills it. Why? Because the insecure are afraid. And fear and faith can't occupy the same heart. It'll rob you. Insecurity about this. It'll rob you to the point of becoming spiritually impoverished and will lead to unrighteousness. It always does. Having settled this once and for all, the question of our eternal security does the very opposite to your faith. It will, man, it will load you up with spiritual confidence when you believe I am saved once and for all. It's done. Your trust in God. It just gets big. Listen to what Jesus said. We're almost done. Maybe. We're almost done. Jesus said that finally. Jesus said this. John 6. Listen to what Jesus said. Right? John said all, all. Remember what that word means? That the Father gives me will come to me. Not one less. Not one more. And whoever comes to me, I will. Do you know what the word never means? Never cast out. Now listen to this verse. John 10. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That's what he said. I'm going to end with this thought. Uh, maybe. I'm going to end with this thought. I've said it. I'm going to keep saying it. If you, can if you believe you can lose your salvation, you will. You will. Because you can't keep from sinning. You can't. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose it today. Or tomorrow for sure. You're going to lose it. Because you will sin. But his death on the cross, wasn't it enough? Wasn't it enough to secure our salvation? 2 Corinthians 6.1, this is the New Living Translation. It says this way, as God's partners, I love that. We beg you not to accept the marvelous gift, this gift of salvation, the gift of God's kindness. And ignore it. You've got it. Enjoy it. Never doubt it. You have it. Believe it. And when you do, hey, you are wearing the helmet of salvation. Is that good news? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this good news. And... And it's such good news. I mean, this, this is overwhelming good news that if we are in Christ, I mean, we jokingly say that you're stuck with us and that's such a great thing to be stuck by God and for God and with God. And if someone's here, Lord, and they're just unsure about their salvation, that today they would, they would hear the gospel, they would know that the gospel is good news and the gospel is about Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. The book of Colossians tells us that he is forgiven. We experience the forgiveness of all our sins, everyone, when we're in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you can be in Christ and if you'll open the door of your heart, he'll come into your life. Just open that door today. Just say, Jesus, I am, I'm just not sure if I'm a Christian. I've questioned my faith. I've, I believe in you. I've had God encounters, but I've never been saved. I've never been rescued. I've never become a Christian because I have all these doubts. 
And today, Lord, I'm hearing the gospel and I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my heart today and change me. Do it. And then put on that helmet. Open the door of your heart today. In Jesus' name, just do it. Amen. It's amazing grace, isn't it? Well, let's sing about it.